In his first trip to Newcastle since being elected Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd toured the region's biggest hospital to see firsthand how the skill shortage is affecting the delivery of health services. Today announcing almost 1,100 new nursing positions across Australia, with a particular focus on regional and rural areas. Here in Newcastle, I'm pleased to say that we'll have 50 of those places allocated to the University of Newcastle, specialising and with an emphasis on mental health. In the Hunter for a Community Cabinet, his ministers then met at the CSIRO Energy Centre, where a few noisy polar bears from rising tide tried to heat up the climate change debate. Newcastle is the world's biggest coal exporting terminal. It's Australia's biggest contribution to the problem. If you look at the huge areas where coal is so important, the Hunter's right up there. So much so, Climate Change Minister Penny Wong will meet with some of our key industries tomorrow to look at how the region will be affected by the carbon trading scheme. The difficulty at the moment is the devil does lie in the detail and we're awaiting the final detail. But we intend to get the detail right and to do it in an economically responsible fashion, including for critical regions like the Hunter. The Hunter Business Chamber is also hoping to bring some of the region's bottlenecks to the government's attention. Roads, rail and port, they are the three big um, solid infrastructure needs that we have and they all are fairly intricately linked. However, anti-binge drinking campaigner Tony Brown believes social issues are just as important. He'll discuss the region's battle with alcohol and antisocial behaviour during a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the PM tonight. We'll be asking the Prime Minister to take control of this whole thing away from the states and the councils. Obviously the PM doesn't have time to meet with everyone, but he'll hear about a variety of issues on the minds of Hunter residents during tonight's Community Cabinet. We'll have all those concerns in the news tomorrow. Penny Evans, NBN News. It's what every expectant parent hopes for, a healthy, bouncing baby. And Ben and Rachel McNamara couldn't be happier with their little lady, Ella Marie. But the tragic reality is not everyone is so lucky. Stillbirth is a very traumatic experience for the family as well as midwives and um, all the staff concerned. So, and we don't know a lot about it. Of the 16,000 pregnancies at the John Hunter Hospital between 1995 and 1999, 1% were affected by stillbirth and researchers have found 59% of cases were male. The overrepresentation of males came as a surprise. There was also concern that mothers with type 1 diabetes had a high incidence of stillbirth. It's possible that patients with type 1 diabetes have abnormalities in the blood vessels supplying the placenta and that may reduce the amount of nutrients going to the baby. As the research advances, it's hoped we'll be able to better predict which women are at risk. But in the meantime, there's certain behaviour anyone planning to become pregnant should address. To make their um, pregnancy healthier, such as smoking and alcohol and their diet. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. Anne Lewis commissioned artist John Olson to paint this landscape of Sydney back in the 60s. It's a sister to his famous work Five Bells, based on a Kenneth Slesser poem. 
Now she wants the iconic work to be displayed in Newcastle. But I'm thrilled to be able to give it to Newcastle, which is the birthplace of John Olson. And uh, Newcastle already has some work by Olson, and this will add considerably to it. It's just one of 50 paintings and sculptures she's pledged to the city. Because I was born in a small country town, I'm a firm believer in regional galleries and the good work they do. And uh, I've always believed it's better to be a giver than a taker. The Premier today paid tribute to the prolific collector who's handing over the works to allow her to get others out of storage. You've set an example to all Australians who are fortunate enough to be in a position to give back to the community. On behalf of the citizens of Newcastle, it's a wonderful gift and we'll treasure it very much. The art gallery is overwhelmed by the act of philanthropy. In this rocky and turbulent time financially, it's wonderful to have such generosity coming to the gallery. Penny Evans, NBN News. When you're the Newcastle Knights, almost everyone has an opinion on how best you should operate. Only last week, in an interview with NBN Television, Newcastle Jets owner Con Constantine suggested the club was preparing itself for sale. The next six to 12 months, we'll find out that the Knights have gone someone else in privatised. We're not going to go out there and do something behind the members' backs, nor constitutionally can we do that. We have to keep people informed. So for anyone to suggest that we've already got a sale in the back pocket and we're going to sell in the next six months is just ridiculous. It's the sort of conjecture the Knights find as unhelpful as it is frustrating, but they're not hiding from the fact they need to develop better ways of financing their operation. Having survived for 21 years without the backing of a licensed club for annual funding top-ups, it's testament to both a measure of good luck and good management. And it's the latter they're implementing now in order to seek more secure means of long-term viability. And there's all sorts of models, you know, that are involve joint ventures, uh, floating, um, other, other forms of uh, revenue streams uh, to uh, privatisation and we'll be looking at all those models. And the club CEO assures the study and any implementation will both be thorough and transparent with sustainability paramount. So if we keep doing the same year in, year out, we will have good years and we'll have bad years. What we're trying to do is get ourselves to a model that produces good years every year. Jim Callanan, NBN News. He was trying to look at the positives, but almost everywhere Gary Van Egmond looked today, there seemed another problem as he scrambles to have enough troops for their coming game. If we don't keep our under-20s here, um, we may not even be able to field a bench. It'd be funny if he wasn't joking, but it's now a genuine possibility after the FFA ruled against a request to keep two Australian under-20 representatives for this week at least. Ben Egmond is already without twin brothers Adam and Joel Griffiths, who both suffered hamstring injuries in Adelaide, while well, Jason Hoffman's season is officially over, with the young striker set for a knee reconstruction instead of fulfilling a season full of promise. I had sort of important stuff coming up with the national under 20s team. We had World Cup qualifiers in November, and you know, I suppose with the Asian Champions League as well with the Newcastle Jets, it's just you know, it's really sort of horror timing for myself. With all that going on, the coach has the job to pick his players up for the coming match against Wellington. What we're looking for is real good leadership from the group uh, and um, they'll definitely be uh, tested by the coaching staff this week uh, because we know that um, the people who stand up after this week are the ones we're going to rely on on Monday. Hopefully tomorrow there'll be some good news with Joel Griffiths expected to confirm a long-term deal to stay a Jet and that really will put a smile on the coach's face. So to have someone like that in your midst for the next um, three years would be a, a real bonus. Prime Minister Kevin Rudd painted himself as an ordinary Australian as he addressed a school hall full of them. He outlined his plans for the country's future and reached out to those struggling in the mortgage belt before throwing the floor open to questions. But most importantly, we're here to make sure we remain connected with you, the local community, who are the heart and soul of this great nation of ours, Australia. From our role in the UN and when we're going to pull out of Afghanistan, to Archie Baji in Parliament and Labor's education revolution and climate change, it seems most Hunter residents are looking at the bigger picture. 
On the local front, Cassie Bertram demanded Cabinet explain why Mayamari, a healing centre for sexual abuse victims at Quarrabalong, is struggling to get ongoing funding. What's the correct process, please, to get Mayamari's voice heard in Canberra? Oh, coming along here. And Kids Safe Hunter asked the PM to commit to funding their unique child safety demonstration home at the John Hunter Hospital. Under the previous government, construction was set to begin next week. Now it's in limbo. We're losing our uh, support, our community support. Uh, we stand to lose this project and that's not what Kids Safe want to see. After just 18 questions, the forum was over and the ministers moved into closed sessions with a lucky few. Kevin Rudd promised feedback on all the issues raised, if not the money and action many so desperately want. Penny Evans, NBN News. Cattle and hay producer Sue Moore spent the day settling into the Mayor's office after winning the top job seven votes to five over Fred Harbison. A councillor for nine years, she says she's chuffed to become the first woman in the role but doesn't want that to get in the way of her duties. I'm trying not to lean on the fact that I'm the first female Mayor. I sort of focus more on being the best councillor I can. The revitalisation of the town centre and lobbying for the F3 extension to Brankston will be her priorities, but she says the freeway extension throws up other issues for Singleton. If we do get the F3, Singleton could become the bottleneck then, so Singleton needs to um, define a bypass route and, and look beyond that before, um, before we become the next bottleneck. Meantime, Barry Rose has been returned as Upper Hunter Shire Council Mayor and one of Musselbrook's youngest ever mayors has been appointed, 32-year-old Martin Rush. Paul Lobb, NBN News. The students weren't there, but there were plenty of lessons being learnt at Newcastle Grammar School. Bike patrol officers from across Hunter Commands were being tested as part of their annual reaccreditation process. Police carefully rode their way through a series of witches' hats set up to represent slow-moving elderly people or mothers with prams in an urban environment. And there were a few glitches. <laughs> But practice eventually made perfect. Being able to ride at a snail's pace is harder than it looks. So they're going to be able to perform skills at slow speed that's safe to the community so they can patrol through malls and uh, shopping centres. Officers don't ride just any old bike. Theirs are custom made at a cost of $3,000. This is a bike designed by police for police. So why do they train in schools? One reason is they provide a variety of terrains for police to practice on, but also to familiarise the officer with the layout, which encourages them to return as part of their patrols. It reduces the uh, risk of uh, graffiti um, and any social hate behaviour that may be conducted outside of the school hours. It also breaks the barriers down with the students. The students feel free to talk to the police. Madeline Bond, NBN News. Despite this year's poor vintage conditions and the increasingly tight economic times, the Hunter Valley Boutique Wine Show has a record equaling number of entries in its 20th year, 540 bottles from about 80 wineries. I thought maybe we'd have lower entries this year but it was a great surprise to get the same number as last year so we're really happy. They've brought in five extra judges to ease the strain on the panel's palates, including some of the Valley's most notable wine industry personalities. There are so many boutique producers in the Valley and uh, this is a very good forum for them to get the feedback they need so that they can look at improving the breed. And the reputation of a medal at such a regionally exclusive show? That actually is increasing in value and it gives them a hook to hang their marketing on so that when you go into their cellar door, if it's won a gold medal here, then it's going to be a, a gold medal wine wherever they go. In his age group, Central Coast sprinter John Wall is the fastest man on the planet. So it was just a natural progression, really, to introduce a fighter jet into his training regime. The Albatross L39 is capable of speeds up to 850 kilometres an hour. But it's a bit sluggish from a standing start, something that John is not. 
So is there really a chance that a man could be faster over 100 metres than a fighter jet? I never go anywhere unless I intend to win. I'm amazed at his fitness. I'm amazed, uh, you know, at his confidence too. With both the jet and John on the start line, the moment of truth came. And John sprinted into the lead. He streaked ahead for close to 40 metres, but then superior horsepower won out and left the sleek 62-year-old behind. Fitter than most men half his age, John says it's up to us to keep active as we get older. Once you pass 40, if you aren't starting to think about what you're doing with your body, by the time you get to my age, you're going to be in trouble. So the idea is to keep yourself fit and healthy, even if it's as simple as doing walking around the block. Make sure you do something. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Joel Griffiths is still yet to sign a purported $1 million deal which would see him stay with Newcastle for another four seasons. The striker says there may be some movement on Thursday and with other clubs allowed to approach players from tomorrow, it shapes up to be an interesting few days. Meanwhile, scans on Griffiths's hamstring have indicated he may be out for up to a month. Twin brother Adam looks like missing just the one game while Danish import Jasper Hackinson's corked thigh may be right for Monday's clash against Wellington. He's the walking wounded, but Danny Badir is still hobbled up to his final appointment for the Knights with a smile. People might think I'm a bit of a croc and it's about time I left Newcastle, but I've, I've had my knee scoped and I've had a, something taken out of my foot, so yeah, it um, hasn't been a good month. Handing over a plaque which recognises Foreshore Park as a place of significance in rugby league history, those grand final celebrations make the grade in Danny's most memorable moments. Yeah, there was 80,000 people here um, in and amongst the town and in the streets and they all ventured on down here to the park and, uh, and celebrated with us. The Super League bound night will soon become a Leeds rhino, but there's a certain Australian game he has his sights set on first. The way Manly have approached the year has just been a full credit to the whole club. They've just been ruthless from, from day dot and then you've got um, Melbourne approaching a siege mentality. So it all makes for a great game, so looking forward to watching it. After months on the bike, it's now all about the family and Ben Demery is savouring every little bit of R&R. &R. Just weeks ago, the partially blind cyclist was wrapped in green and gold, representing Australia in the 1K time trial with pilot Sean Hopkins. They finished both races with Paralympic records, subsequently broken by Britain, but silver was certainly sweet enough. I went there with no expectations of anything. I thought just to finish a race would be good fun, but... To come away with two silver medals and in both the events we targeted was awesome. Ben had his fiancée, dad and mum, brother and sister-in-law and five mates in Beijing, so there was no problem finding people to celebrate with. And I know that other countries were there and had no support, so to have a crowd like that was just awesome. His first taste of the Paralympics, one to savour, and having witnessed some inspirational individual performances as part of the audience, it's definitely something he'd like to sample again. It's sort of how the Olympics used to be, it's about trying for your best and not so professional I guess, but doing what your best is and I guess a lot of those athletes have to overcome a lot more than an Olympic athlete has to, but, and they train just as hard as an Olympic athlete. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. And, and if you don't have too much, then if it's raining, take the plastic shower curtain and you might look great. You know, I'm just saying, do things yourself.
Without the constant activity along Newcastle's growing high-rise strip, the local economy would be struggling. In the last five years, there's been a doubling of engineering construction in the city. There's a lot of apartment uh, approvals and development taking place. The Royal Newcastle Hospital site through Mervac's a, a good example. And there's even a lot in the pipeline if we're looking at uh, general property trusts with the development at the, um, of the mall in the Newcastle CBD. The Master Builders Association says large scale construction is surging while new house building is taking a dive. The residential sector is uh, struggling uh, a little bit. We're finding that renovations and alterations aren't too bad, but new housing is certainly well down on previous years. I think the uh, figures for August, the DA approvals were down about 10% uh, on August of last year. Meantime, new figures from the recruitment company Hudson show that mining remains the main driver of the hunter's economy, with employer confidence up on last quarter. More than 50% of managers surveyed said they would be hiring more people in the next three months. The hunter was, um, was second uh, only to Queensland with regards to employer confidence, uh, which is very positive. Prior, in the prior quarters, we've sort of trailed behind WA as well. Paul Lobb, NBN News. It wasn't the end Ron Swan was hoping for. Despite failing to get re-elected to Port Stephens Council, the city's former mayor chaired the start of last night's meeting before handing over the reins to Bruce McKenzie. The 70-year-old was elected as council's new mayor seven votes to five after an eight-year break from local government. In Newcastle, Greens councillor Michael Osborne was named Deputy Lord Mayor. He'll hold the position for just six months, with councillors resolving to rotate the role. Aaron Buman stayed true to his pre-election stance, highlighting the need for council to change the way it operates. If we continue to do the same thing, we're going to end up with the same result. And in the end, change is what they got, with council voting to start Tuesday night meetings half an hour earlier, cut their duration by one hour and reduce councillors' speaking time to three minutes. The Hunter Business Chamber is now calling on all new councils to revitalise central business districts and to reduce red tape in development approvals. We believe that in some of our local government areas that over the last four years things could have been done a lot better. Uh, Newcastle in particular, we believe that uh, development needs to move quicker there. Madeline Bond, NBN News. The 2007 World Superbike champion James Toesland gets more excited about fighter jets than passenger aircraft, but after investing in Aero Pelican with his English mate Ian Woodley, the 27-year-old is showing an interest. I don't know much about it other than my life is, is, is spent on a plane going on to different circuits, but um, uh, it's a really uh, interesting project to start in. The airline, which began operating from Belmont in 1962, but which is now based at Williamtown, was sold a fortnight ago to the group known as Business Air Holdings, which has airline interests in the UK. We've um, spent some time obviously making sure that the uh, takeover goes smoothly, making sure the customers and, uh, and our relationships with the staff are properly looked after. That seems pretty good um, and the next thing now is just to sort of understand the business a bit more over the next sort of couple of months and then to look how we can to uh, how we might develop the business further. The owners wouldn't commit to returning the recently axed Newcastle to Tamworth service but hinted that new and revived routes would be considered next year. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Strike from the 
If anyone's welcomed the warmer weather, it would have to be Josh Blair, who's trained all through winter for the toughest race on the surf sports calendar. It's an event you'd love to say that, that you've won. Um, it always goes down in, you know, in history. There's not many names up there that, are, that can say they've won the cool and get a gold. The closest he's come to doing that was in 2005, finishing seventh. He made his debut a decade earlier, and still today, it's an event he can't let go of. Just the challenge of the race, I mean, you're over that four hour mark, there's so many different elements with the, with the conditions you can get up there on the Gold Coast. Held on the 19th of October, the ultimate test of endurance includes a ski, board, swim and three run legs, a 46.65 kilometre caning and what a way to start a season. It's a springboard into obviously the, the Kellogg series will be running again and I'll, I'll most definitely probably set myself after, after the goal to do the trial. Unlike Blair, Paul Harrigan is a little less prepared for his own personal Everest, who with wife Pam are about to walk the Kokoda track. But perhaps the Chief should have been carrying Josh's board today, the eternal optimist freely admitting training's fallen by the wayside. I've still got a couple of weeks to go, so I'll, I'll dig in a bit more, but I'm kind of hoping once I get there, the old instincts will kick back in and I'll be, should be OK. Adam McIlwick, NBN News. As Minister for the Hunter, Jody McKay, found out this morning... And it cost them five bucks, that's all it cost me. Dennis Blunden is all things cycling. Be it teaching kids how to ride or securing state money for new velodrome lighting, once he starts something, he rarely stops. The next project I want to try and do is get the driveway done. If we can get that tarred, that's another job out of the way. But it's inside where the real work is being done. Eight hunter riders will race the UCI World Masters in Sydney in two weeks and Charlestown's Steve Darricott is a real medal favourite. We've got the national title in the pursuit so, and the Australian record so hopefully the individual pursuit, two kilometres. He's been made to wait for his chance though. Last year he was forced to pull out after breaking his ribs. Actually it's still sore 12 months on so it's, it takes a lot of healing but the legs are alright. As for 72-year-old Dennis, he'll sit the Masters out after breaking his pelvis three weeks ago. Even still, he's preparing a comeback, a world record attempt no less, to cover the most laps in one hour. I want to do that before I retire. If I can get that, that'll do me then. I'll get that and that'll we'll retire then, I think. Adam Hill, NBN News. Holiday makers were few and far between on Hunter Roads, but Highway Patrol officers are already out in force. Operation Slow Down begins at midnight along with double demerit points. In the Hunter, police will target speed and drink driving offences with extra officers on duty. There will be more RBT done in and around Newcastle and the Lake Macquarie area. They'll also focus on fatigue, seat belts and illegal mobile phone use. While the long weekend doesn't officially start until tomorrow, traffic is expected to build up in the region well before. We can pretty well expect it right from um, this evening. And police are reminding motorists not to be complacent on rural roads. Drivers just need to be aware um, on country roads that it's just as dangerous as driving on major highways as well. That danger was realised at Howes Valley late this morning when a 61-year-old Wollongong man died after his motorcycle collided head-on with a van on Putty Road. Police say he was trying to overtake a car at the time of the accident. Madeline Bond, NBN News. True Gain workers presented a united front, speaking publicly for the first time on claims the oil recycling company is responsible for a foul odour wafting over Rutherford. We are absolutely certain that our site is not creating an odour problem. There is no clear evidence, no clear proof. 
The bold comments follow the company's win in the Lands and Environment Court yesterday, with Justice Terence Sheehan granting a stay against the Department of Environment and Climate Change's move to suspend Truegain's licence. Justice Sheehan stating on the evidence presented, the applicant may be found to have caused little or none of the environmental harm of which the local population has complained. The company claims to be the subject of a state government witch hunt. It's hard not to think that we're simply being scapegoated so an impression can be created that something's being done about the supposed odour problems. The legal battle is taking a heavy toll on workers. It really dispays me uh, to see our guys in the morning and not give them the satisfaction that I can't give to the guys to say, yeah, you're going to have a job tomorrow. Truegain says if the state succeeds in suspending its licence, the company will fold and 30 locals will lose their jobs. This would be a $60 million stab to the heart of the hunter economy. Madeline Bond, NBN News. Since opening in 1993, Port Stephens Winery has built a business that some of the bigger Hunter Valley vineyards would envy. As well as its Aussie visitors, the cellar door welcomes around 70,000 international guests each year, mostly from Singapore, Korea, Japan and China. And as a result, even the staff have become multilingual. We've really capitalised on the tourism market, uh, both domestic and international. Uh, we'll have anywhere between you know, six and ten coaches a day come through here to experience the Australian wine experience. They stop in for an authentic Barbie lunch on their way from Sydney to Nelson Bay to see the dolphins. But the operation in Nelson Bay Road has just been sold to Murray's Craft Brewing and the new owner wants his own beer on the menu right next to the wines. The uh, microbrewery has been lodged with uh, Port Stephens Council uh, and the ultimate goal there is to really create a, 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 a total beer, craft beer, boutique wine and great food experience and we'll do that right here in one, at one location. The winery has already advertised for three new staff but as many as 20 will be needed if the brewery is built. Paul Lobb, NBN News. It was a show that took a group of whale watchers by surprise off Port Stephens late yesterday. A female humpback apparently teaching her tiny calf how to fly. We've been watching a mother and a calf from a bit of a distance and suddenly the calf started to go off and it was amazing. And then all of a sudden three more started to go. So we had mothers and two calves and uh, it, the water was alive with jumping whales. For an hour, the little one practised launching itself out of the water, with mum looking on only metres away. The humpback mothers bring their calves in very close along the coast, and there's about 700 on their way down right now from uh, the Barrier Reef. So once the calf, which has been feeding at 400 litres of milk a day, uh, has had enough to eat, it just gets very active. Bit of a sugar hit, and off they go. And, and they won't, you can't keep them in the water, they're trying to fly. Scientists believe the art of breaching may be an alternative form of communication other than underwater sonar, or it could be to shake free barnacles and dead skin. 
Mum also gave Bub a fin slapping demonstration, which the pint sized performer quickly managed to pick up as well. The whale's return trip to Antarctica will be complete around the middle of November. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Joel Griffiths remains hamstrung on the injury front, but his club certainly isn't when it comes to securing its new marquee beyond this season. Arguably the most influential player we have um, within Newcastle in the short tenure that the club's been uh, existing. And the Jets have backed up their claims with a three-year deal, among the biggest in their history, beating the new A-League franchises to the Johnny Warren medalist. They did show uh, interest, but... Saying that, you know, you've got to think um, outside the box and I did that and I thought Newcastle was the best option at my point in my life, on and off the field. The 29-year-old says he still has the option to play overseas during the A-League off-season. Ultimately, though, it's up to club bosses to grant such leave. And it wasn't the two-for-one deal many expected. His brother Adam yet to re-sign. I think it'll be very unfortunate if he if he does leave because you know I think he's one of he's a, our backbone of of this club you know so um, you know and he's and he's very markable as well. So is Joel another reason why the club wanted him to stay. He's the first one to put up his hand to to do promotions. He's the first one with the kids. Um, I can't be prouder of the way that he conducts himself in relation to wearing our our club colours. Adam McHilrick, NBN News. When Heath Francis was growing up, his mother, Margaret, wanted him to play a musical instrument to provide balance. That was our one battle, I suppose, in life, yeah. the whole way through. Sport won out, of course, and Heath has been there, bought the T-shirt with the medals to match, and when he rates Beijing his best Paralympics, believe it. It's a triple treat for Heath Francis! From a personal perspective, this was really, really special. What made it even more so, Mum was there too. It, it was the most overwhelming feeling and it was super special because he'd done world records and I knew that's what his goal was. He took out the 100, 200 and 400 metre sprints but it was the relay bronze the Aussies really had to work for. A bout of chicken pox hit the squad and that was just the start of it. A thrower coming in at the last minute who hadn't done relay changes and who hadn't done much running and never run in spikes before. Um, the sort of drama that you just can't get anywhere outside of Paralympic sport I guess. Despite losing his right arm in a farming accident when he was seven, nothing's ever been too hard until now, deciding what lies beyond Beijing at his Bural base. I couldn't think of a better place to come back to and, uh, and just have a bit of time to, to let my thoughts sort of settle and sort of plan on, uh, on what I want to go on to achieve next. And never before has Mum's advice been more apt. That bit of music is still there within him and you just want all those skills that you've been able to uh, offer your children as they grow up to be implemented later in life. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. One of Jetstar's Airbus A320s was going nowhere today after a fault with its wing was discovered during overnight maintenance. Passengers booked on the 6.20am flight to Melbourne learnt of the cancellation as they arrived at Newcastle Airport. We jumped out of the car and um, a fella standing behind the car said, are you going to Melbourne? And I said, yeah. And he said, no, you're not. Steve Ritterford and Danny Aratoon were among many heading to this weekend's MotoGP at Phillip Island. They understand that mechanical problems happen, but were angered by the way the airline handled the affair. They gave everyone a phone number for a booking office and said, um, go your best. Oh, I'll never fly with them again. It's, um, I think it stinks. It's, um, yeah, no explanation for it. No one can answer anything. Can a customer service call the number they gave us? There was no answer. You were on hold for some some fellows were on hold for an hour or two hours. Jetstar has since apologised for the way passengers were treated this morning and arranged to bus some to Sydney to meet ongoing flights. Others were offered refunds or flights on other dates. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
Newcastle's no stranger to natural disasters. In 1974, the city was hit by a cyclone commonly known as the Cygnus Storm. Then in 1989, it was shaken by an earthquake and just last year, devastated by a flood. We've also endured intense bushfires. Most have come with little or no warning, so it makes sense to be prepared. With that in mind, Newcastle and Lake Macquarie councils pulled their resources to create this information pack for seniors and people with special needs. And we felt that there needed a, some information about um, what to do between when disaster struck and when the SES could reach those people. They're being handed out during education seminars like this one for the Newcastle Association of Independent Retirees. The SES says the most important thing is to have an emergency kit ready to go. Because should you have to leave in a hurry, you haven't got time to race around and collect all your medications and various things like that. The kit should contain a blanket, medicines, bottled water, a battery operated radio and a torch. Madeleine Bond, NBN News. We've spent uh, just over $170 million on 15 new locomotives and 328 new wagons and they're very much to support the growth that's both here now and coming over the next three to four years in the coal chain. They've rescued plenty of people over the years, but how about saving three lives in one hour? According to the Australian Red Cross, every blood donation helps keep three people alive, whether they be accident victims or leukaemia and cancer patients. We're there servicing the community uh, during floods and storms, and this is only another part of our community effort. The Newcastle unit has joined SES volunteers across the state, spurred on by a loss in their ranks. One of our young members, I believe in Sydney, uh, had leukaemia and the call went out for extra blood but unfortunately she's since passed away but they kept it on a roll and said well okay let's get a thousand units of blood. And with a shortage of blood and platelets there are calls for all donors and first timers to help bolster low stocks. The past winter has been particularly bad for the blood service this year and as a result our blood supply hasn't been strong for quite a few months. The long weekend won't help, the blood banks are closed for three days while hospital demand increases. Next week will be critical following the long weekend. Our Newcastle and Maitland donor centres will be open Tuesday uh, right through to the end of the week. Donor mobiles will be at Charlestown Mall and Hawks Nest on Monday. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. She's already queen of the Chris Lee stable, but it's the four race princess series that Samantha Mears can wrap up tomorrow with the Group 1 flight stakes in Sydney. Yeah, it's uh, only been done once before, actually by a Newcastle horse in 1993 in X, so um, hopefully the tradition continues. Drawing wide, it'll be a test of her dominance over the fillies, but she must if she's ever going to challenge for the famous Cox Plate. If she steps up to that next level, it's a huge ask. Uh, weekend hustle on them type of horses, they're the best going around and it's you know, probably Australia's greatest race. So um, I'm very mindful of that, so we'll just get through tomorrow and see what happens. Given the way he throws them, few would back against Tua Lavini. Despite a short professional career, the 21-year-old winning five from six, he's landed himself a shot at the Australian light middleweight title on Sunday in Melbourne. Fighting undefeated Victorian Pat Rulo, it's easily the biggest bout of his career. 
and Newcastle's King Edward Park turns car circuit on Sunday for the two-day hill climb event. Sunday is round seven of the state series, while on Monday it's the Tri-Club Challenge that will have drivers racing the clock. If England wanted to get under the skin of the Australians, they went about it the right way. I don't think they have the aura anymore, and particularly with um, six of us playing in the ANZ, um, we've managed to completely get rid of that um, totally. The Diamonds fairly bristled at the notion. Well, you're talking about aura. They have to find it, OK? <laughs> Norma Plummer is rebuilding the Diamonds after a range of retirements, but coupled with recent injuries, there's no hiding a level of vulnerability ahead of the Test Series against England, a team now coached by Australian Sue Hawkins. Everyone has a point to prove, but um, I just want these girls to go out and shine and, and you know, show, show the world that um, they're class. But just try telling that to the Aussies. It's probably a good thing for us because, you know, every time someone tries to slam us down, we're just hungry and eager to get out there. Now one of Australia's most experienced plenty rests on Gerard's shoulders and those of Captain Natalie Von Berto. Affected by illness, she's determined to be leading from the front. We're tre testing uh, different things and this is the time for people to stand up and put their hand up if they want to be out on court for the Australian netball team. Can't be a fence sitter, so I'm going to take Manly, just the... Um the way they've just gone about the whole year. Unfortunately, one of them is going to be a bit unhappy and one of them is going to be happy. So uh, I think it's Teddy's turn, you know. Quinny won it last year, I think Teddy uh, is due for one. I think uh, I'm going to show some support for the, the club I'm going to. I'm going to go for Manly. They've been uh, in some pretty good form over the, well, pretty much all season. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm tipping them. I think Melbourne, just because, you know, there's so much going against them. They've had, you know, some negative press, I guess, about the grapple and that sort of thing and, and about their whole club. So I think that's going to work for them. According to witnesses, a man was stabbed outside their Swansea home at three o'clock this morning while his terrified girlfriend watched on. Police are remaining tight-lipped about the circumstances of the crime but say one man is in custody and they're looking for two others. Meanwhile, police are investigating a glassing attack inside the Warners Bay Hotel just before midnight. A 22-year-old Ellie Barner man has been charged over the incident. Police claim he smashed a schooner glass into the left side of a 20-year-old man's face after the two apparently became involved in an argument. The victim has undergone surgery in John Hunter Hospital. Police are concerned about the increasing number of glassings in the region. Some of these in the past have, have um, proved to be fatal. Now we've got a young 20-year-old um, male who's the rest of his life now be carrying the scars of this. The alleged offender will face Belmont local court later this month. And in Newcastle, police are hunting three men who assaulted the owner of this scrap metal business in Wickham at 6.30am. The offenders, dressed in blue overalls and balaclavas, attacked the victim while he was opening his shop. One of them armed with what we believe was a hatchet or something similar. The proprietor victim was able to um, defend himself against this offender and as he was doing that he was struck by rods and pipes by the other two offenders. The men then stole the victim's ute which police discovered abandoned in a Ties Hill Street late this afternoon. Madeline Bond, NBN News.
the you know the easiest of rides. He had to use his jockey skills. Chris Lee says, "Well done," and uh, too bad you. A daughter of Renew's Choice, uh, Samantha Miss, winning the Group One Flight Stakes and doing it easily. She is clearly a cut above her own generation, and now may be destined for even tougher combat uh, in the Cox Plate against uh, the best. and uh, he rode that beautifully. Yes, indeed. Uh, he started so well this preparation with a brilliant first up win at Newcastle, but then he went a bit quiet, finishing near last. It was thirsty work for the Jets today, but Jasper Hawkinson didn't seem to mind. He's just happy to be up and running. A cork thigh was the latest in a raft of injury setbacks he suffered since arriving two months ago, but he's ready to fire on Monday. They bought me to, to, to score some goals, you know, and, uh, and we have to score more goals than what we did now, and uh, hopefully we'll do it on Monday. He had the radar locked on at training today, but marquee player Edmundo Zuri is the man who they really need to fire up front, given they've lost A-League Golden Boot winner Joel Griffiths to injury. Among those out to stop him, though, will be former Jet, now Phoenix captain Andrew Durante, who's one of four ex-Jets now with Wellington. That's like a bit of a sibling rivalry, they're mates and you sort of don't want them to get on top of you. So, nah, it's going to be good, mate. Nah, once you, the old cliche, once you cross the chalk sort of thing, it's, it's all uh, no mates. They all hope the three o'clock kickoff on Monday will be cooler than today's training. Schedules. The Mariners' men were less than impressed to read in an Adelaide paper they had discipline issues. Seven minutes in and the referee must have agreed with Pedge Bowich, the man in question. Uh, he's clearly got the ball, it's clearly no penalty. While there were queries over the foul, Travis Dodd left no doubt with the penalty. It was a fruitful first half for the home side who added to their count care of a corner and a Robbie Cornthwait header. Well, he's got one over the goalkeeper and it's headed in by... The Mariners responded. Adrian Caceres with a searing shot that did everything but go in. And just before the break, good pass. Caceres lines up the shot. Two nil down, the Mariners were still a chance, but only minutes into the second half, Adelaide looked to have secured all three competition points, care of Cristiano. And it's forced home by Cristiano. It forced a few Central Coast changes, but the tide turned on the back of this challenge. We're arguing, Ange Costanzo with the challenge on Matt Simon. Putting Mile Yednak on the spot, he doesn't miss from here. The kick, and he tucks it away. Mariner's marksman was at it soon after, with Yednak proving he can do it from long range as well. He drives one and scores a second. 3 2. Suddenly, the impossible proved probable, and Matt Simon's form of late has been irresistible. When his angled shot found the net, the Mariners felt like winners. the keeper. It's 3 all. Incredible. Central Coast almost did steal it, but considering the position they were in, they'll settle with one of the greatest comebacks in their history. What a match we've had at Highmarsh. It looks good on paper, and the new William IV committee hope its plans for the ship will soon become a reality. After a generous donation from Bloomfield Colliery, two new diesel engines will arrive from China in the next month or so. The idea to turn the billowing steamship into a diesel-powered beauty. The uh, unreliability of the manoeuvring of the vessel was the, the big problem, but we hope to keep the coal fire uh, uh, operation available in the future for special occasions. Installing the engines plus repairing the hull, a paint job and other restoration works will keep Willie on blocks until the end of the year. In order to ensure the long-term future of the ship, we do need uh, community support. Uh, we're trying to raise uh, another $150,000 to complete the project. 
Once the ship is back in the water, its new home will be here at Honeysuckle. A floating dock will be built near that red buoy, so the William IV is close and handy to the new Maritime Museum. It's a very fine line between um, somebody just being stitched up at the hospital or something a lot more serious than that and even uh, they can prove fatal these incidents. If England was to end a 27-year drought against Australia, then everything had to go its way. <laughs> Playing the wrong national anthem wasn't a great start, but with the home side without sharpshooters Catherine Cox and Cheryl McMahon, they remain vulnerable. Ranked third in the world, England is desperate to climb higher and a new look squad showed it's definitely on the improve. With athleticism at the back, Australia's big guns were forced to provide the answer. The diamonds sparkling in the goal circle as well as they opened a small buffer. As they cleared out to a six goal lead at one stage, the English showed plenty of fight to peg back the margin. But when they needed it most, their radar deserted them. Not so the Aussies, who maintained a winning margin built on some wonderful defence. Australia home, 42-39. Celebrating 100 years, the NRL was keen to honour some of those who have made the game great. From former players to ageing rockers, as John Stevens wound back the clock. No prizes for best cook on ground, as smoking barbies got bashed about. While Victorian band, The Living End, showed their true colours. And I feel there's a storm coming, ladies and gentlemen before belting out the theme of the afternoon. This battle came with all the trimmings, even the prize required a military escort into ANZ Stadium. But the trophy, which features Norm Proven and Arthur Summons, was placed in their care before kickoff. Finally, the fight to see who'd leave with it was on. Fullbacks don't often meet one-on-one, -on -one, but Brett Stewart was quick to welcome Billy Slater to Sydney. Stewart soon had his own issues. He says, where did that go? His opposite happy to show him how it's done as their personal duel ranged. Right up above the pack. The pace of this game was state of origin-like. Steve Menzies barely had time to make it on field for his last NRL game when the Sea Eagles got across. Of all the favoured first try scorers, Matt Ballin must have been at long odds, but the hooker snuck under everyone's guard. Now he's got it down. If that was hard for Melbourne to watch, it got no easier when Manly attacked again. There was just a coat of boot polish in it, but Michael Robinson got the nod from the man upstairs. Leading 8 0, the hits kept coming after the break, with Robinson's name up in lights once again. Matt Orford laid it on and it was pinpoint perfect. Grand final tries are rare enough, 
but hat tricks are just about impossible. Just about. If the trophy wasn't already heading home with Manly after that, it was after this. This has been one deserving grand final try. From there it was party time come early with this contest as good as over. Whoever wrote this script was clearly watching through maroon and white eyes and there was barely a dry one when this man crossed. In his last game, Steve Menzies got the farewell every player dreams of. It ended 40-0. Brent Kite was named Clive Churchill medal winner. But it's the big trophy that counts most. The party on the Northern Peninsula to last for some time yet. But still they attack, it is Cleaver. Who's 20 metres away? Another field goal attempt. No! A kick down the blind side. Ewey! 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 Haraki has scored! From! Ewey! Haraki has won it for Wendwinville! Big chance for the Raiders. Kennedy with the ball. Raiders are going to score. Raiders have won the grand final. They've broken the deadlock. This one has gone to the 88th minute. And they have done it. And the minor premiers are home, and the Broncos have missed out. Well done, the Raiders. They score a try in the second half.